Good morning to some, good afternoon to others. Welcome. My name is Christy Thomas. I'm a project director at UCLA Integrated Substance Use Programs in the Pacific Region Node. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matthew Wright, or some of you may know me as Matt. I'm a protocol specialist with the CTN uh, Clinical Coordinating Center at Emmis. I've been here about uh, three years now and have participated in multiple uh, CTN trials, including uh, 48, 52, uh, 53, and soon to be 60. And hi, everyone. My name is Dee Bloomberg. Um, I'm a social psychologist with a background in models of self-control and health behavior change. Um, I've been working at Emmis now for about five years as a protocol specialist, and I've been involved with several studies, including 48, 53, and my two current studies are 51 and 55. Okay, I am fortunate to have worked closely with Matt and Dee on prior CTN studies, and I'm now pleased to have this opportunity to co-present with them on the topic of preparing for closeout of studies and sites. During our time together today, we will focus on identifying critical activities essential for timely and efficient closeout. We'll outline roles and responsibilities of key personnel and discuss regulatory obligations, documentation requirements, and other processes required at the end of a study. We will also make an effort to share our experiences and lessons learned in the closeout of other CTN studies. We have designed the presentation such that there will be several opportunities for you to provide input and share your experiences with Closeout, so we look forward to hearing from you as well. Many of us are familiar with the story of the tortoise and the hare. Slow and steady wins the race. While there are many varied interpretations of the moral, I like to think of it as it isn't so much how you start but how you finish. In clinical trials research, however, it is both. How you start can be closely associated with how you finish, and it is best to start and finish strong. Before we go further, let's reflect on why this topic is important. I find it useful to always bear this in mind. Clinical research is a highly regulated field, having a familiarity with our historical roots through our HSP, or Human Subjects Protections Training. We understand the evolution of the best practices we follow and why various regulations are in place. Thus, it is our regulatory obligation to conduct high-quality clinical research adhering to applicable regulatory requirements whether they be FDA regulations found in 21 CFR or the Code of Federal Regulations or HSS regulations found in 45 CFR, applicable state laws or policies of our local institutions and IRBs. It is also important to keep in mind as partners in the clinical trials network, there are expectations and standards for how we conduct our work that have been set by our sponsor, the NIDA CCTN. So closing out studies and sites properly can be viewed as a demonstration of our compliance with our regulatory obligation. Additionally, tremendous resources have been invested in the studies we conduct, resources of time and money, our time, participants' time, sponsor dollars, or might I say taxpayer dollars, that while invested in one study, were unavailable for supporting another. All this in an effort to allow us to answer an important research question and to contribute to generalizable knowledge in our field and ultimately improved care for patients. Finally, it matters or we do a good job because it is our job. And I know contributing to high quality research, adhering to applicable standards is important to each of us personally. I have been working in clinical research going on 18 years, 12 of those in the CTN. In my time before the CTN, I recall someone jokingly saying, studies don't close out, they slowly peter out. This is certainly not the case in the CTN. 
since the early days of the network with the work of the Regulatory Affairs Subcommittee, or RAS, the Quality Assurance Subcommittee, or QAS, and joined later by our partners at the Clinical Coordinating Center and the Data and Statistics Center at MS. Great effort has gone into making all of our trial-related activities as straightforward, standardized, and efficient as possible. This has been accomplished largely through collaboration. In this slide, you can see key personnel involved in closeout are the same key individuals involved throughout the implementation phase of the study. At the research site, there are activities performed by the research assistant, research coordinator, medical staff, and principal investigator. At the Regional Research and Training Center, or RRTC, site support staff like the local quality assurance monitor and node protocol manager, director, are involved. The national project director and lead investigator usually affiliated with the lead RRTC or lead node have responsibility for overseeing trial implementation and are involved as well. The Clinical Coordinating Center, or CCC, and Data and Statistics Center, DSC, staff listed on the slide are heavily involved in closeout, just as they are throughout the course of the study. And many of their major responsibilities have been delegated to them by and on behalf of the sponsor. Our external partners, such as the central lab, central pharmacy suppliers, and regulatory bodies each have a role. Since we're in it together, and it requires such an extraordinarily contort, um, coordinated effort, regular communication is key. Some of you may have attended the CCC webinar entitled, Getting Multi-Site Studies Up and Running on Time, presented in 2013 by Colleen Allen of the DSC, Eve Gelstrom of the CCC, and Frankie Kropp of the Ohio Valley Node. If so, you probably saw this slide. I'm showing it here to remind us of the enormous volume of activity involved in the time period from study development to study start. Fortunately, many of these tasks, once completed, provide a solid foundation for trial implementation and, if maintained, put you ahead, or at least on pace, for an efficient and timely closeout at the end of the study. Simply stated, Preparation for an efficient site and study closeout begins well before the first participant is enrolled in the trial. The timeline from study start to closeout flows as follows. So once the study starts, much of the focus is on participant recruitment, retention, and data collection. We commonly think of closeout activities beginning once enrollment is complete and the last participant last visit has occurred, leading into the two-month period before database lock. While closeout activities certainly increase during this period, one of the goals of this presentation is to emphasize preparatory activities begin at the start of the study and generally conclude with database lock or shortly thereafter. Database lock is often the milestone that triggers IRB study closure notifications, but this can differ depending on local IRB policies and guidelines and often has to do with whether or not the local site investigator will be involved in data analysis or manuscript preparation post database lock that involves ongoing access to personal identifying information. After database lock, the raw and analyzable data set is prepared by the DSC the primary outcome results are analyzed and the results and data sets are sent to the lead investigator who is responsible for submitting a final study report to the CCTN within four months. The primary outcome paper is to be submitted within six months of database lock and as per NIH policy, the de-identified study data set along with the protocol and supporting materials are to be made available on public data share within 18 months of database lock. So if you were involved in the CTN STRIDE study or CURB study, you should know these studies were just added to DataShare this week. This Venn diagram illustrates the core components of site closeout. In today's presentation, Matt will cover safety and regulatory, QA and monitoring, and study personnel. Z will cover medication supplies and equipment, 
data cleaning, and records retention and storage. You will notice these are the major sections of the CTN site closeout preparation checklist. This checklist was developed jointly by the CCC and lead nodes of recent CTN studies. I recall first using the checklist in the current form on the CTN0048 curve study. Now the checklist is the standard tool used in all CTN studies to ensure steady progress on tasks needed for study and site closeout. The instructions call for participating site to assign a site study team member, preferably the study coordinator, the responsibility of tracking site closeout activities and maintaining the checklist on an ongoing basis. The site staff is to complete as many items as possible on a weekly basis and send the updated checklist on the final business day of the week to their CCC protocol specialist and the lead nodes. While the checklist is mostly the same across CTN studies, it can be modified as needed to address protocol-specific needs. For example, in the CTN0054 ADAPT study that was recently closed, we had to modify the checklist to incorporate tasks related to the final disposition of study cell phone equipment, dosing video data, and longer-term storage of frozen biological specimens, which aren't commonly included in other trials and wasn't previously addressed in the checklist. When adjustment to the checklist is required, it is usually done in collaboration with the CCC protocol specialist and lead node project director. This ensures when site staff receives the checklist, it is complete and sufficient to answer all matters common and unique to a given study. Now let's look at our first polling question. How many of you on the call have been or will be involved in study closeout activities by the end of this year, 2015? So it looks like the responses are continuing to come in. And if you're still interested, please record your response. I'll be closing the poll momentarily. Okay. So it looks like 86% uh, of so of you will have participated um, or will participate in closing out a study this year. So maybe you're participating in CTN 53, 59, or 55. So if so, today's presentation will be especially relevant to you. Uh, and then for the few of you, about 14% who are not participating in closeout this year, don't worry, this material will be applicable to you as well. It's never too early to start preparing. So if you're just starting to enroll or are still in the developmental stages, the steps that you take now can make a big difference. Okay, uh, thank you, Chrissy, for that, that great overview of, of closeout activities. Um, I'd like to continue the conversation by talking about some of the, uh, the key components that Chrissy mentioned earlier in the presentation, and I'd like to start by safety and regulatory. So, as we approach closeout, um, most of the safety-related uh, closeout tasks are about ensuring that the safety events that occurred during a trial or the adverse events that occurred um, are appropriately reported uh, so we have a clear picture of what occurred during data analysis. Um, so it's important to stay on top of, of making sure that the events um, that are reportable are entered in Advantage EDC. Um, prior to closeout, all reportable events must be entered in the EDC and the uh, safety monitor uh, will begin to review those, uh, those adverse events to make sure that, that things are entered appropriately and that all events have been resolved, either uh, with or without sequelae or uh, resolved by convention. And I often get questions about uh, what resolved by convention means. Uh, so for the purposes of closeout, um, while it can be used in, in multiple scenarios, but, but most often, around closeout, it's because a participant has, uh, the, the site has lost touch with a participant and it's been uh, at least 30 days in which time um, we allow the, the site to enter that the AE has been resolved by convention. 
so the safety monitor will be making sure that the, the resolution, um, any of these resolution uh, items are, are entered. Uh, like reportable adverse events, um, all protocol deviations that occurred during the trial must be entered in Advantage EDC, and they must be complete and resolved prior to site closure. Uh, so some of the, the uh, items that we're looking for um, is a description of the event, um, a corrective action, um, and a plan to prevent reoccurrence of the event. Um, also, we're looking to see if the event was reportable. And if so, if the PD did require IRB reporting, it must have a corresponding date of report. Um, now, sometimes a, a deviation is not reportable until, or, or isn't required to be reportable until the time of annual review, um, in which case uh, that option is available in the EDC uh, for future reporting. Uh, so prior to close out, the CCC protocol specialist uh, will consult with members of the lead node and perform a, a cleaning, if you will, uh, deviation cleaning prior to the closeout, and this may result in um, a request for site staff to make some edits to those deviations. Uh, Matt, this is Dee. Do you mind if I add a few words here? No, not at all. Um, so I'm actually in the process of um, a protocol deviation cleaning with my 51 team. And I realized that some of the common errors that we've been finding may be especially relevant to this group because um, these are errors that we find in every study kind of um, across protocols. Um, so it would be good for this group as you're preparing for closeout. Um, so I want to mention a few of the, the most common ones. And the first is names that appear in descriptions of PDs. So it's important not to include any personal names you can say participant, you can say research assistant, so use the role, but not the actual name of the person. Um, another thing that I've been noticing and we see a lot um, is just basic spelling mistakes. Um, there is a spell check at the bottom, at the left-hand corner of the CRF. Um, so when you enter a PD, it's good to kind of do a final check before you submit it. Um, Similarly, there are a lot of abbreviations that we use, acronyms that we use in PD descriptions that probably should be just spelled out. Um, part of the reason for this is that all of these PDs that are reported that you as sites report into the EDC um, go not only to the lead team, so lead node, NIDA CCTN, the CCC, and DSC, but we also um, submit those to the DSMB. Um, and what the DSMB really is, it's, um, it stands for Data Safety Monitoring Board. Um, it's required for multi-site clinical trials um, that involve interventions that might have a potential risk to participants. So the DSMB really serves to oversee the study. And in particular, they look at the safety of participants and the integrity of the data. Um, so we give them, for every study at every DSMB meeting, a full listing of, um, of the PDs, of all the PDs that have um, occurred in the trial until then. So if you think about it that way, you'll realize some of these um, things that we ask for are not so much errors, but they're things that help us present to this committee. So acronyms, we know them, but they don't know them. Abbreviations, same thing. We know them. The DSMB is not composed of CTM members. Um, they don't know all the kind of terms that we use. Um, a few other things that we often find are very long entries. So the description of a, of a protocol deviation should really be concise. Um, you don't want to go into too much detail. Um, if you think again about this DSMB, um, imagine that they're receiving maybe on average for a large study it could be hundreds of deviations that they're reading through. And so the longer they are, the more complicated the process of review is. So it's good to be kind of short and to the point. Um, another thing that we check for when we kind of clean um, deviations is that often similar occurrences, similar deviations are written up in a different way or under a different category. Um, that's something that's hard to tell in the beginning because sometimes an incident can sound perfectly reasonable under one category and another category. But when we see a pattern of all these deviations, it's kind of easier for us to see, well, um, you know, misassessments were written up under 
laboratory in one case and just regular misassessments in another when they're really mentioning the same actual procedure that was missed. Um, so that's something that we often look for. And the final thing that we sometimes find is a kind of misunderstanding or misconstruing what resolution is versus corrective action. Um, and so, so what we really ask for people in terms of resolution is to look at that specific event. What happened at that specific event? If the participant missed a measure, was it done later? Did you call them back? Was it just not completed? Um, so just saying how that ended up, how that turned out. Um, and then in terms of corrective action, that is also what will, will you do to prevent future incidents from happening? So how are you going to look to the future? Um, now another thing, I mentioned the DSMB, um, but this report of all the protocol deviations of the study also goes in the final study report. So that's another reason, that's another group that will see these PDs and another reason that we want to keep them short, that we want to keep them clear and accurate. Um, so I hope that helps. I hope that helps you as you're kind of nearing the end of the study. You don't have to wait for the um, lead node and the protocol specialist to kind of inform you of something they'd like you to modify. You can always go through your own um, deviations that you've submitted and see, maybe check the spelling, look if you put any names in, look if there's something very long, an entry that's very long that you can make shorter, more concise, more clear. Um, so. So that's, that's basically it. Uh, thanks, Nat, for, for letting me share that. Sure, Dee. Um, all great points. Thank you. Um, so regarding the regulatory binder, um, the site regulatory binder, files must be complete and uh, copies of all of the required documents uh, should be uploaded to the regulatory tracking system. And this needs to be done uh, prior to site closure. So. Underneath here, I have a list of some of the more common um, regulatory documents that would be required at site closeout. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time describing them because that could uh, warrant a whole presentation in and of itself. Um, but the, the main point I want to make here are that there are certain documents that are required to be sent to the CCC via RTS, and likewise, there are certain documents that the lead node may require. And sometimes these requirements may differ from one another. So it's really important to, uh, to, to pay attention to the instructions that are included in the closeout checklist and also to the, the list of required uh, regulatory documents that the protocol specialist uh, provides to each site at the beginning of each study. So prior to closeout, uh, the protocol specialist will provide uh, each site with a list of all uh, regulatory documents that are housed in RTS. And this list will contain uh, any, any action items uh, that are required to, to kind of close things out uh, in RTS. And I've provided uh, an example of what one of these reports may look like. Uh, now you'll see that there is a document status category and this is typically where we would, um, would capture that a document may need some attention. Either it's missing an RTS or, or something in the document isn't, isn't complete and it needs to be re-uploaded. Um, the protocol specialist will work with uh, each site um, to make sure that the files are complete and, and that all of these, um, these action items has, have been resolved. Um, for IND trials, uh, a 1572 must be completed um, for the investigator and the sub-investigators, and uh, that hard copy must be sent to the CCC prior to site closeout. That's something that we would typically ask for as the study is ongoing, um, but all hard copies must be received by the CCC prior to site closure. Uh, likewise, for non-IND trials, uh, the investigator would sign an investigator agreement uh, which also needs to be sent, a uh, hard copy sent to the CCC uh, for filing here. There are some tasks uh, that, that just can't be completed uh, until after database lock. So, so once the, the closeout visit occurs, um, that doesn't mean that all closeout activity at that site has, has stopped. Um, certain things can't be done until after database lock. So I've included some examples here 
Um, we, we do need some, some staff to stay around uh, for things like data entry and, and regulatory uploads and whatnot. Um, so the final staff delegation log can't be completed with PI signature and end dates for all staff uh, until uh, after database lock. Also, we do require uh, notification um, or excuse me, acknowledgement of IRB notification of study closure. Um, so that's something that would need to be uploaded to RTS after database lock. Um, and also a uh, final site closeout checklist uh, would need to be sent to the CCC and the lead nodes. So these are all items that, that uh, are ongoing through database lock and cannot be completed until afterwards. Um, so as, as these items can't be completed, uh, they would be listed as action items on the site visit report at closeout. So uh, next I'd like to discuss uh, QA and monitoring as they pertain to closeout. So generally, um, sites participating in CTN trials uh, will have two uh, closeout visits. One is done with the local QA at the RRTC, and then the other is done uh, with uh, NIDA CCC protocol specialist here at MS. So these are typically some of the items that are covered uh, during the closeout visit. Uh, the main point here is that the monitor will go over kind of the three R's uh, of closeout, the, the roles, the responsibilities, and um, the requirements. And we've tried to standardize this by uh, providing this information in a closeout presentation. So the monitor uh, will prepare some slides that she'll review uh, with, with the staff that's present at the closeout visit. And these are just a few items uh, to consider regarding the closeout visit. Um, closeout visits may not occur until after the last participant last visit has occurred. Um, ideally, uh, the local QA monitoring visit will occur prior to the CCC uh, closeout visit, but that's not a necessarily a requirement. Um, CCC closeout visits can either be done on site or remotely by a conference call. And at minimum, uh, the site PI and the uh, study coordinator or research assistant uh, must be present. Typically, it's, it's anyone who would be uh, responsible for continuing data entry or, or uh, um, query resolution and things like that. Um, finally, once all uh, closeout action items have been uh, resolved and, and approved by the CCC, um, we'll distribute a closeout memo indicating that your site has been officially considered closed. My last item I'd like to discuss um, is uh, study personnel and what's involved uh, with, um, with wrapping things up in, with uh, st staff as they start to leave at, at closeout. So as a reminder, um, updated CTN research staff information forms uh, should be sent to the DSC help desk for staff as they leave. Um, this is something that you do at the beginning of the study uh, when staff are coming on board to the trial and, and beginning a new protocol. And likewise, it's something that needs to be done at the end uh, to let the DSC and the CCC know uh, that staff are no longer active in the trial. It's also important to remember that um, on the delegation log, as staff uh, begin to leave at, at closeout or, or during implementation of a trial, um, it's important to capture those end dates on the delegation log and upload a new copy of that log uh, to the RTS, to the regulatory tracking system. And this would let the protocol specialist know that that staff is no longer active, and so we would you know, not continue to bug you about uploading uh, uh, new copies of expired documents and whatnot for that particular staff member. So staff members that continue to perform certain study functions, uh, such as those that use Advantage EDC for data cleaning purposes, uh, or for those who use the regulatory tracking system or RTS for regulatory uploads, these staff would need to stay on through, um, through at least database lock uh, to make sure that if any tasks come up in those areas, that somebody is on site who is able to address them. Hi, Matt. This is Christy. If I could just add to your point there. Sure. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to be careful about is what I call the problem of vanishing staff. So as a site, we struggled with this as well, uh, and that is toward the end of the study, usually after enrollment is complete and we approach the last participant, the last visit, 
the active participant workflow begins to dwindle dramatically. And because funding is limited and we feel pressured to keep people busy, and justifiably so, uh, during this period we start to see staff transferring to other projects or being given tasks other, uh, that take them away from the needs of the study. Uh, a growing pile of to-be-filed regulatory documents sometimes can accumulate. Queries aren't resolved as quickly as they were during the early phase of the trial or uh, responses to a discrepancy noted during a monitoring visit is unable to be resolved, quote unquote, because the individual now tasked with addressing the query isn't the person who collected the data. So as a site, there's no real easy way to manage this dilemma except to be aware of the challenge and to plan for it ahead of time by ensuring that study budgets are developed to account for staff time through database lock, and to ensure that if staff pick up additional duties or transfer to other projects, that the re remaining team members know everything necessary to complete the project and to address questions as they arise. Thank you, Christy. Um, so the, the staff information form, again, uh, can be found um, on LiveLink, and I've, we've provided the address here. And if you have any questions about this process, you can always contact the DSC Help Desk, uh, and that email address is, is listed below the LiveLink address. So let's go ahead and talk about medications, supplies, and equipment. This is also a very big part of closeout, um, something that you're going to really want to make sure to do correctly um, as you near the end of the study. Um, for medication, the most important thing is first of all determine who has the disposition authority. Um, this will be indicated on your site closeout checklist. And the site closeout checklist is really um, important to work with. It's going to have a lot of the information that's just going to guide you through the process in a very detailed and customized way. Um, as a general note, the same source that provided the medication is the one that decides what its, um, what its disposition is at the end of the study. Um, some medications will be destroyed on site but sometimes the study medication will be returned to Eminent, our central pharmacy, and in that case, they or the CCC will provide detailed instructions. Um, another key point is drug reconciliation. So um, this is very important, not just at the end of the study, but throughout the study. It's important to have um, very clean and accurate logs. Um, during the final closeout visit, the monitors will be taking a very close um, examination, making a, a really thorough examination of those logs, um, but it's good not to wait till the last minute. So one thing I can suggest is towards the end of the study when there's fewer participants, um, there's a little more time that you might have, um, that would be a good time to go through the drug logs and see if there are any discrepancies between different logs that you have, between logs in the EDC, um, things like that. Just make sure that everything kind of makes sense and is clear and will kind of um, reduce the time needed to deal with it at the end of the study. Um, Dee, do you mind if I just make a quick point here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so one thing that I, I've seen in, um, in previous studies as, as they've been closing out is um, for, for drug studies, um, the, the vendors that we obtain um, the drugs through um, sometimes uh, require that the, the reconciliation forms and the drug logs uh, be sent to them for their records. So, so site staff um, and the, the, the monitors really aren't the only ones who may be seeing these, these records um, at the end of a trial. So that's why, you know, that's another reason why it's really important uh, to make sure that the logs, um, like, like Dee said, are, are clean, um, that they're decipherable, uh, that things have been entered consistently, um, and, and that um, someone who's not familiar with the trial uh, is able to, to follow it um, after the fact. Uh, so it is very important to make sure that those logs um, are, are readable, essentially. 
Perfect. Thanks, Matt. That's that's a really good point. So often, um, a lot of the a lot of the study data um, and reports and logs um, are going to multiple sources, multiple people, organizations. So um, I agree, and this is going to be true for 55, um, 51, and several other medication studies. Um, great. So so moving on to supplies and equipment. Um, one important thing is that towards the end of the study, the protocol specialist is really going to work with the, with the site to maintain a very low supply inventory um, at the site, and that's to reduce waste at the end of the study. Um, so we don't want you um, to close out and have just piles of supplies that, um, that are not needed. Um, what that means on your end is that it's important to be very accurate in the weekly inventory that you perform towards the end of the study. And that also means that we may ask for specific expiration dates. So if you have 10 Vivitrol kits and the expiration that you provide um, on the weekly inventory is for the end of this coming month, um, the, the specialist doesn't know if it's one kit that will expire or all of them. So we might ask for a more detailed account. Um, so that's something to consider towards the end. Now, then, same as medication, the, the next point is to, um, to figure out who provided the supplies, and um, that is the person or group that is going to determine what happens at the end of the study. Um, the information is all indicated on your site closeout checklist. So again, work very closely with that. Um, the checklist is really something that we created to try to make this whole process easier and clearer for you. Um, so it doesn't seem so daunting because these are these are large, um, sometimes complicated studies. In terms of supplies, you might have over a dozen supplies from three or four different places. So. Um, so, so this is really meant to help you. For each site, um, for each study, we'll have a customized um, site closeout checklist that will let you know exactly what to do with each item. Now that said, I'd like to talk um, more generally about what most often happens with um, general supplies that we use across protocols. Um, some of these items may be donated at the end of the study. And that includes the urine collection and testing supplies. Um, so for example, urine cups, the UDS dip cards, single strip tests, um, adulterin strips, all those kind of supplies. Um, lab kits, so clinical laboratory kits, needles, and so on. Um, of course, this all, um, this all is with the assumption that these are unused and not expired. Um, supplies. Then there are other items that must be destroyed at the end of the study. And these include items that are very study specific and really shouldn't be used for any other research or for any clinical work. Um, they include things like the prescription labels, um, the airway bills that have very specific site and lab information. Um, and any expired supplies that are not returned. Um, and the destruction is generally um, per local and institutional guidelines, but that is something that will be, uh, you'll, you'll be receiving more um, specific instructions at the end of the study. There are also items that should be returned at the end, and these include the genetics kits. Um, those, are, uh, those are sent back to the NIDA repository, to Rutgers. Um, there are also other kind of protocol-specific supplies. For example, if your study used ECGs and those were provided by the CCC, those would have to be returned at the end of the study. Um, and it's important to keep the boxes, the original boxes they came in um, to process that return. Um, if, on the other hand, um, like in study 55, you're using ECGs but they are not provided by the CCC, you would not have to return them to us at the end. And finally, there are a lot of supplies. These somewhat differ in different studies, but there are a lot of supplies that are provided by the node. Um, often things like gloves, Band-Aids, um, the freezer or refrigerator, blood pressure machine, random items like that, um, including office supplies and computers as well. And for these, the node will let you know exactly what to do with them, whether you need to return them at the end of the study. 
also important to note is that all returns have to be completed before the monitoring closeout visit. So similar to, to the start of a study where you complete your site readiness checklist and make sure everything is completed before there's the initiation visit, this is similar but in terms of closeout. So you should be completely done with your site closeout checklist, have your items taken care of, marked off, um, and then the monitor comes for that final kind of review and visit. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, and this is another important area during closeout, um, is data cleaning activities. You're all familiar with your data managers for the study that you're participating in. Um, the data managers are part of the DSC, the Data and Statistics Center here at Emmis. And you work with them throughout the study. They are the people that generate data quality reports, missing forms and missing value reports, and integrity checks throughout the study. And you're going to be working very closely with them as well, um, especially during the closeout, the closeout period. Um, so the first impor important key kind of feature for closeout is to maintain complete and accurate data. Um, that you should be doing throughout the trial, but especially towards the end, really going through and making sure that everything is entered, everything is precise. Um, you can check your data completion by looking at your missing forms and missing value reports. And similar to what I mentioned for drug logs, um, the same thing with data cleaning. Towards the end of the study when there's fewer participants, maybe a little more time on hand, that would be really the perfect time to go and clean your data. You don't have to wait till the end, um, and in fact, you shouldn't wait until the end because at the end of the study, there are going to be additional queries by the DSC. The statisticians will start taking a look at the data, having more questions. You'll be getting more, um, more questions for your data manager. So, so it's really important to stay up to date so at the end you can deal with those things and not um, with entering data that was months ago. Um, some additional things to think of is to complete all your exception requests, so for out-of-range items, missing value, missing forms exceptions, as needed, not to leave anything to the end. End of study forms for each participant should be submitted and signed by the PI, um, and that happens when the PI feels that the data collection is complete. That should be after checking for missing forms, missing values. Um, now, signing the end of study form does not mean you can't change things later, um, but it really is just a reflection that, um, that it seems like everything is complete. Um, generally, the PI will have 30 days from the time that the end of study form is entered um, to when they should sign it. Um, another important thing is to look at the monitoring discrepancy report and resolve all data discrepancies. This is another thing that really should be done throughout the study, um, but really good to stay up to date so you don't leave everything to the end. Um, as closing gets near, the DSC is going to generate more frequent reports, so more frequent queries, missing values, and so on. Um, it's very important to be responsive to their requests, and it's also important to be comfortable and, um, and not hesitate to contact the DM for help or questions towards the end. So we're all, the, the lead node, um, the CCC, DSC, we're all here to help you, um, and all of our objectives are to make sure that there's a smooth and kind of nice closeout for the site. Um, the last part I wanted to really discuss has to do with records, retention, and storage. Um, and before I really go into some of my material, I wanted to pose a question for, for all of you. And just if, you, if you'd feel comfortable sharing your own experiences from studies that you may have been um, involved in, how, how in those studies has the research staff stored the records? Um, so this could, be, this could be electronic or this could be paper records. Um, but if you don't mind indicating that in, in the chat, I would be interested and I think other folks would be interested to hear a little about how this is being done at different sites.
and you can even say just a word or two, like a bullet about who is the one that is in charge or who uh, or where you put it. Um, oh, I see already um, a response here. Um, Sarah, thank you. It's Sarah Farkas saying that um, paper records are stored off-site. Um, so that, that's always been interesting to me to see kind of whether they're stored at your location or, or kind of stored off-site. And, and that's, um, that's something that's interesting. I don't know um, if it's common for other people. Maybe they're stored at the location where the node PI is. Um, oh, I see a few more posts. Let me kind of read through those. Um, Elizabeth Chapman is saying that the information is stored is at the RRTC. That's what I was kind of wondering about. So, so that's um, another area people have used. Um, Dagmar is saying that a secured file cabinet with a key at the site. Um, so that's, that's very important um, so that these are secured as well. Um, oh, we're getting a lot. All right, this is great. Let me read through some of these. Um, paper records have been stored in locked cabinets in a locked room at the site. So good. So there's some variation about whether it stays at the site or at the RRTC. Um, Patrice is saying paper records stored on site for three years. Great. And that's something I'm going to deal with. Thank you um, for that. Um, some go to the university record retention facility. So it could be the university has a facility for all um, studies that are affiliated with it. Um, and electronic records maintained by the RRTC and a back drive. Great. Um, one site has a dedicated file room with file cabinets that stores all the CRFs and regulatory files. And a final submission here is saying that paper records are stored on site by consent forms and other things off site which are de identified and locked. Oh, great. That was, that was a lot of information, and, and that's, really, that's really helpful. Um, and one other um, that just came in is that really depends on the study, but the electronic is all password protected. Um, and that's something that I want to discuss, so that's, that's perfect. Thank you guys for, um, for sharing that. So, so there is a lot of variation, and that's what I was kind of expecting. Um, but it looks like there are some standard kind of measures that are used. Um, and it's important that sites do establish these procedures. If your site um, is, is towards closeout this coming year and hasn't discussed it, this would be the time to really, to really think about and document what your process will be to archive your research records. And by records, I mean both paper and electronic um, in a way that complies with all of the regulations. Um, it's important to know both your sponsor and your IRB and local expectations and guidelines for retention of these documents. Um, the sponsor expectations are um, right here on this slide. And at a minimum, for the CTN studies, we require that they be maintained for three years after database lock. Now, of course, this is just the minimum. So if your local or institutional guidelines are for longer than three years, then you would keep them longer. Um, now, for electronic, I'm glad that some people responded about their electronic records, because that's something to consider, too. So we have paper records. Um, all of you mentioned things like um, putting them in a locked file, whether they're on site or off site or at a special um, facility. Um, but electronic records are important as well. So, so how do you store, how do you move these materials? Are you taking them to USB? Are you, um, are you defragmenting your computers before returning them to the node so that no material is there? Um, all these things are really important to, to think about as you're, as you're preparing, as you're thinking about the process and preparing for how you will store your records at the end of the trial. Hi, Dee. This is Christy. Can I add um, something to that point? Yes, please. Great. So I just wanted to echo the importance of storing records with the expectation that someone will need to find something later. So it's tempting to think that when you box and whether you're shipping it off uh, to another location for long-term storage or they're boxed and they're housed uh, in a designated office on your local site uh, premises, 
it's tempting to think that you'll never see those records again. And it may be true that you won't see those records again, but that doesn't mean someone else won't have the fortunate and sometimes unfortunate task of calling for those boxes and trying to find something that you stored long after you're gone from the site. So you might ask yourself, if someone had to do that task, what might they be saying about you later? What's going to be your legacy? And I can tell you if you've boxed the boxes and labeled them informatively and accurately and maintained an easy to retrieve filing system with binders or file folders, maybe they'll be saying a lot of nice things about you. Uh, but if things were rushed and everything was kind of thrown in a box quickly without the expectation that someone would need to look in them later, you may be making your colleague's job that much more difficult, if not impossible. And actually, several recent CTN studies that we've closed, we found ourselves having to call back those stored records, in one case, to retrieve urine drexarine data that had not been previously included in the study database. And often that was individuals who were not even familiar with the study that had to go back and retrieve those records. In some cases, things were very clear and complete. In, in other cases, it was apparent that maybe a urine drug screen had been collected, but for whatever reason, in the way that the study information was documented, we were unable to retrieve those results. So you see both happening, and, and it becomes particularly difficult if it's someone involved in the process that wasn't directly involved in the study. So to the extent that you can have that in mind, meaning an expectation that someone will need to look through these records, um, because we're finding more often than not we're having to do that, that you store them, label them, organize them in such a way to make it easy for retrieval. In another recent example, we actually had to retrieve those boxes in order to uh, pull out locator data that had not, um, that was needed because the study teams or the network decided to conduct a longer term follow up study that had not been initially planned at the start of the main study. So individuals had to retrieve these documents in order to pull out locator forms in order to contact participants invite them to participate in this upcoming study. In some cases, the locator form data was very complete and it was really easy to at least send a letter or contact an individual. In other cases, what we found was locator forms were almost blank. Uh, and, and that could happen because we typically don't QA locator forms during the course of the study. We collect them, and often if you're the person working with that participant on a regular basis, you're not having to go through extraordinary measures to contact them. And so until you really need the locator form, often we don't find that it may be insufficient or incomplete. And so just keeping that in mind and just emphasizing the points that were made earlier about the importance of keeping really complete records um, documented on time, in real time, it makes really someone's job later much easier in terms of retrieving things that were stored. Thanks, Steve. That's all the point that I wanted to make. Thanks, thanks. That's a really good. Um, that's a really good point, and um, and and that's that's something to think about. So we do. I, I agree. We tend to kind of assume, okay, this is where we now put them aside, and um, in three years we'll we'll be able to destroy them or longer. Um, but that's true. Often we find that we need to go back into those files, need to retrieve um, data, and so it is even more imperative that we really um, store them and and remember where we store them and. Um, um, have it clear so that it can be done. Um, th that's great. And, you know, that makes me think if anyone else has um, a story like that they'd want to share, or just, um, I, I know you all had comments that I kind of ran through briefly, but at the end of, um, at the end of this presentation when we open the lines, if you'd like to share a little more about how your site or your um, study uh, that you participated in has done this before, what you're planning to do, I think that would be interesting for the group. It's, it's interesting to hear how others do it. Um, and also what you do with your computers, what you do with the computers that you have um, on site that may have data or materials on them. Um, so what you do with those before you kind of um, uh, return those, or uh, that, that would be interesting to me.
um, definitely. Um, all right, so, so one last thing that I wanted to talk about, um, and this is the documentation. So the, the sites prepare clear written documentation of the location of these documents and the process for retrieval. Um, and you inform, it's important to inform the lead team, including the CCC at closeout. Um, now, informing is really, what I mean by that is that you let us know as part of the site closeout checklist, there's a portion at the end that asks for the specific location, the contact person, and that type of information. Um, so that's where you indicate where you're going to store your, your records. And then um, you would be asked to confirm that during the closeout visit by the monitors. Um, so that's something that you should be thinking of. Um, so it's good to have a process. It's good to have a person. Um, if you think about what happens in three years' time or five years' time, that might change. People might change positions. It's hard to kind of go back and, and remember these things. So it's good to have really a person that's a contact person for these records and a good documentation of where they are. Um, it's also important that you notify us if the storage location changes. And again, because we're dealing with such a long time, it's pretty reasonable that it may happen that you need to shift locations. And that's fine as long as everyone is in the loop. So the Node PI will generally alert the lead team, including the CCC. And it's also very important to n notify prior to destroying the protocol records. So even if the appropriate time has passed, don't just go and destroy them, um, but really notify before you plan to, to destroy. And by notify, I mean that the site should contact the lead investigator and the CCTN. Um, now there are there are some practices that we we would kind of suggest. Um, so some sites have cre created an SOP for closeout. That is something that's certainly um, certainly encouraged and recommended. And if anyone wants to talk about that, if you have kind of a set process, a documented process, that could be more than helpful um, during the end. Um, and some, this might be your first time, so, so we're going to see a lot of variation here. And I, I'll leave some time for, for discussing that when we, when we open up for questions in a minute. Um, so that's all I had for, for my areas, and um, Christy, would you like to take it and uh, wrap up the presentation? Great, thanks, Bea. So wrapping up, we just want to emphasize that preparation for efficient closeout really begins at the start of the study and careful and timely execution of all trial related duties throughout the course of the study will aid in the closeout process. That is, as Dee pointed out, staying up to date and not leaving things to the end. For example, um, Matt shared with us the importance of maintaining regulatory documents unexpired and filed appropriately, uh, that data are collected completely and accurately and queries are resolved in a timely manner, especially that the protocol is followed and the safety of participants is protected. If a deviation or adverse event were to occur, report it within the required timeline, and all these efforts on the front end will dramatically reduce the time needed to close out at the conclusion of the trial. Appropriate site staff must be available through and beyond database lock. Often the PI is around, certainly, but it is critical that knowledgeable support team members, preferably those directly involved in the collection of the study data, remain available as well. Be sure to utilize the tools and resources available to you. This includes people resources like your CCC protocol specialist, your DSC data manager, your RRTC and lead node staff. If you have questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to ask for help or for clarification. On this slide, we've shared with you some of the resources used in developing this presentation and things that you would um, want to review if you're just looking for additional information about closeout processes and expectations such as ICH guidelines, and there's a link provided for you. 
It's also important to be familiar with the NIDA CTN Policies and Procedures Guide. Um, version 5 is where we're working with, and that's available on the CTN DSC2 website, as well as LiveLink. And it's always important to be familiar with your local institutional IRB policies and procedures. And of course, I think your main resource and tool that we've discussed throughout the course of this presentation today is your CTN closeout preparation checklist. So we've reached the end of our presentation, and we'd like to pause for a moment to open for questions and comments from our audience. So Christy, uh, while everyone is um, sort of thinking of what they find challenging um, when uh, closing out a study, I know you've had uh, quite a bit of experience in closing out studies. Is there any particular personal challenge that you have about closing out studies? Hi, Tracy. Sure. Um, I, you know, I think everything that we heard today has been relevant and useful, and I've had some, uh, experiences related to each of the challenges we've talked about, whether they are um, maintaining staff on site throughout the end of the project, um, particularly it's challenging, as I mentioned, with pressures to keep people busy and avoid some of the meandering around the office place and the downtime that we see to um, to kind of transfer people to other projects or, and often, you know, when people see work is dwindling, they make choices to do other things and we support that and actually we love to see that in terms of going back to school or um, taking a higher uh, position maybe related to the field. But I think it's really important to keep in mind and working with your site management staff to make sure that there is a plan in place for individuals to remain throughout the closure of the study so that anything that comes up, questions that need to be answered, uh, discrepancies that need to be resolved can be addressed in a timely way. Fortunately, we just had the experience of closing out CTN 0054 and the study team, although it was three sites in that trial, so it was a relatively small trial by comparison to some of the other studies that have gone on in the CTN, the closeout process actually, rather than being two months long, was actually one month long. And that really is a credit to the tremendous job that the site staff did during the course of the study with staying up to date on data entry, data collection, resolution of queries, ensuring that there is always very timely uh, reporting of protocol deviations, adverse events, or if, if they were to occur, and that even at the end of the trial when participant activity was diminished, there was a regular review of the database addressing queries that were sent by the data manager. So there wasn't a whole lot to do at the end. So we have our expectations of monitoring visits, so we have our local monitor come out and do their closeout. The MS monitor was able to do, in some cases, a remote closeout. And things just moved very quickly. So I just think to the extent that we can really understand and appreciate that preparation begins at the start of the trial, our closeout procedures in the CTN with all the collaboration um, that has gone into developing the system and the process will make things very, very efficient and timely at the end. So that, that's been my experience. And I, and I think in our network, because we have such a tremendous group of professionals that take their jobs really seriously and do a good job from day one, I think we have very few problems maybe by comparison to other kinds of studies and other um, venues. Thank you so much for that, Christy. I mean, I think that was a very uh, good summary from the uh, from the local node or, and the regional node uh, perspective. And Matt and Dee will come back around to you from the CCC's perspective. But Eve uh, Gelstrom from the uh, Clinical Coordinating Center has her hand raised. Eve, or would you like to uh, address the group? Sure. Um, thanks both, uh, not both, <laughs> Christy, Dee, and Matt. That was great. We really appreciate um, you all helping to bring forward a lot of things that um, are so integral to doing a really good, smooth closeout. Um, I was involved both with closing out 50 sites and 37 sites, you know, for the CTN 50 and 37 studies. And from kind of the CCC perspective, the protocol, spe protocol specialist perspective, um, 
you know, using that checklist is really, really helpful. And um, the protocol specialists will make from the CCC will make themselves available to the sites and probably have we do readiness for uh, endorsement calls at the beginning of studies and oftentimes we will do readiness for closure calls at the end and so that is the time when they'll go through literally line by line w through the checklist with the site staff and the node staff uh, so that if there are any questions that anybody has on how to fill it out because I know the first time I looked at it you know if I was from the site I kind of go now what do I put where and how do I do this so just utilize that time on those readiness calls or just pick up the phone if you're filling it out and you just aren't really sure I know you know Dee and Matt encourage that and I just wanted to let people know that we are very used to questions on it we want to help you fill it in um, it's it's a very useful tool for us to check with regulatory, but also just for everybody to make sure you get your ducks in a row. Um, I wanted to also share one experience as to why it's really critical to have both on the checklist and then the monitor will actually put it in the site visit report, uh, the closeout report, where your documents will be um, after the study is over. Uh, several years ago, I got a call from um, Mary Ellen Michelle, who was the assistant director at CCTN, and she was in the process of assisting with an internal audit at, at NIDA, at the CCTN. And she called and she said, I need you to help me find, and it was a list of like six different things. And what I did and what helped me a lot was able, was able to go back to um, checklists from the 44 and from some of the earlier 46 and some of the earlier studies and literally be able to pick up the phone because it has the contact person, their name, their email, and where the documents are. And I literally could pick it up. Now, there were a few cases where I could not find that information, and I had to start chasing node folks and site folks who weren't there anymore, and it got pretty complicated. So I just would really underline, and I think it was Christy who'd mentioned this, um, that you, know, you put both in the checklist and then we'll also put in the report who the contact person is, where they are, how to reach them, and then if anything changes, and we know it does change now and then, you may plan for things to go to Iron Mountain or you may plan for them to be in your locked filing cabinet down the hall and then two years later your site moves or that hall is taken over by another department or that filing cabinet has to go somewhere else. So just make sure that you inform folks um, where things are so that when things come up, we, um, we all have a much easier time of it. So thanks. I just, I, I sometimes having an example helps people go, that's why they're asking for that. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you, D uh, Eve. That was a great experience, uh, particularly from the CCC's perspective, because we'll be called to coordinate the effort with the site staff. Um, but we really would like to hear from the site uh, research uh, team um, about the challenges or experiences or ways in which they've um, approached uh, some of the topics addressed in this presentation to overcome you know, it as a challenge. So get those hands raised. <laughs> Meantime, um, Matt or Dee, did you want to talk more from the uh, Clinical Coordinating Center or the Data and Statistics Center um, perspective. So this is Dee. I guess I have one thing. One thing from our um, perspective is that I think, and we get this a lot, is that before the the closeout visit, there's a lot, there's a rush. Kind of at the very, very end, there's sometimes a rush um, where suddenly we're contacted every day and a lot of questions and what do we do with this and. Um, and so I, I guess my, one of my recommendations would be to really start early. Um, and although I know some folks have already been emailing us, even though closeout is in a while, it's been months and months away, but kind of what should I do with this? How should we prepare for that? And, and I think that's a, good, that's a good mindset. So I, I think it's, uh, and Christy brought this up as one of the key points um, for today's presentation is kind of looking at this as a, a longer process. So there are things that you have to wait until the end, but the better prepared you are, the smoother it will be. So right now, and even for those 14% that were saying that they don't have closeout this year, some things you can already do to be in a really good spot is 
uh, do data cleaning. Um, you have your reports right now. They are all available at any given moment. You can go through and make sure you are completely up to date and everything is, is ready to go. Um, drug logs, same thing. You can, you can look through them. You have time. You can take your time. You, can, you have everyone on site still. Um, so it is a good chance to, to go through those kind of processes. Um, coming up with procedures for where you're going to store your records. That's also important and can be done in advance. It could be done the year before. Um, so there's a lot of things that I think you can do earlier that will make it a bit easier later. Um, and, and also, again, to reiterate that we are more than happy to help with any, with any of the process. Um, so be very comfortable contacting your node, contacting your data manager, protocol specialist. We're all, we're all really here to help and um, make sure that closeout goes well. Great. See, this is Christy. I would just offer one other um, experience related to closeout, but also just to ask the group if they've had any challenges in particular that like, they'd like to share. We certainly uh, love to hear from you all. But with regard to storage of records, and particularly electronic records, which is a newer phenomenon, I think, in our work, uh, one of the things that I've found particularly useful, and actually has just come up for me this week, we had a recent site within our node closed, and what we typically have is the local sites ship their records to us at UCLA, and we then um, look through those records and then move them on to long-term storage at Iron Mountain facility. So we actually have our local monitor here to review the records once they come in from the site. Just for completeness, having a monitor go through that process haven't been at the local site and reviewing those records throughout the course of the study, they have an appreciation for what should and shouldn't be present in the files. And what we've found is instances which the sites having every intention to box up everything um, may have neglected to include, for example, the temperature logs that were stored um, next to the refrigerator or next to the freezer or next to the room that had the supplies and not have gathered them all together and actually put them into the regulatory file um, of essential documents. And so sometimes things get inadvertently missed. And so we were able to discover that the just this week in looking through some records that have been shipped here from a site. Uh, the other thing is with electronic records. So sometimes we have a secure server on which we store lots of our study-related uh, electronic documents and often we'll either burn those through a CD or place them on a thumb drive for longer-term storage. It's useful to actually create a companion document to that CD or to that thumb drive that explains what's on it. So for example, if you have to look through those electronic records to find certain things, if the files folders aren't named clearly, it may be difficult to figure out now where is that XYZ log or where is that um, ECG for participant XYZ if it was received back from the cardiologist and stored in an electronic document. So one of the things that our local site did was actually take screenshots of the file directory and file names and add a caption saying what's stored in each location. And that document accompanied the thumb drive, which explains what exactly is on that file. So as we were having our local monitor go through to find things, it became a little bit more intuitive. So that's just a suggestion that we found helpful, and maybe others have had similar processes um, for how you store and um, identify your electronic records. Uh, Christy, I had a question on that. Um, so um, a, a number of uh, organizations um, are going to the electronic um, record keeping. And so um, do you find it helpful to use the regulatory binder set up for that, where you use the same folders that would be in the physical folder, um, also set up for the electronic folder, or do you come up with your own uh, set up there. Now this varies, I think, from protocol manager to protocol manager or director, depending on um, 
how you like to work and what's intuitive for you. I've actually entertained the idea of setting up the electronic file similar to the way the, um, the paper records are stored in the regulatory binder with the same classification system. Sometimes what you find is some sections don't have much in it, particularly for an electronic document. So you may find yourself pulling out paper, scanning them just in order to store and to create a complete electronic companion set. And so in some ways that hasn't, or I haven't found a way to make that as helpful. But certainly there are certain sections that just naturally lend themselves to an electronic storage, particularly with some local IRBs moving to uh, electronic submissions of documents and away from the big, tall stacks of papers that we used to submit. And so that section of the regulatory binder generally is a good fit for electronic storage. But that's been my experience, and I'm happy to hear how other folks on the call may have worked on that issue as well. Okay, great. Well, I would like to officially thank everyone for attending. Um, I think the information was put together really well and concise because this is a longer process, as you've mentioned um, and reiterated throughout the, the presentation. I am going to edit this presentation uh, so that it is available to individuals uh, to reference again when they need it, either later or to just do a refresher. But I'd like to take this time also to thank Christy, Matt, and Dee for putting this information together in a single format. And um, I'm sure you can use this as your closing out sites uh, going forward. Um, but we want this to be a resource for individuals um, so that uh, we can continue with our improved processes for closing out studies and sites. So thank you very much. Um, the presentation will be available on the CTN Dissemination Library's website. If you click on the banner and choose Training, you will see it there in about 10 to 14 days. Um, directly following this presentation, uh, there will be a survey available for all of our participants today to provide feedback on their experience. So we encourage everyone to do that. Um, and there also will be an email, um, so you'll get two reminders for that. Uh, and also next month we have a, uh, a new topic, Family Involvement in Substance Use Disorder and Mental Health Treatment and Research. So we look forward to everyone being there on May 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, or Dennis Daly and John Hamilton will discuss this topic. And um, an invitation will be sent out within a few days to all of our CTNers. You can forward it to others you feel will be uh, interested in attending as well. Um, that will complete our presentation today. Everyone, thank you, and I look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>